Hello everyone, welcome to Recorded Lectures from Oral Pathology 360. Before we begin with today's lecture, let's uh, note some important changes to Oral Pathology 360's weekly program and services. Starting now and up to June 2023, Tuesday's live streams are replaced by recorded lectures. There will also be a temporary interruption in our newsletter service. You can find out more about the reason by watching the town hall, which was last week. And the video for that is available on YouTube and Facebook and LinkedIn pages. Now, during this time, that is till June 2023, you can watch our recorded lectures, which will be set to premiere at the regular time, that is at 17.30 IST on Tuesdays. While you can also watch them later anytime, watching them together will help us the chance to stay connected through the chat. So please try and join us if possible at this time. Information about the upcoming videos will be shared on Mondays across our social media pages and website. All links to these pages are given below in the video description. You can also subscribe right here uh, by hitting the uh, subscribe and then the bell button to receive notifications by choosing all notifications. There you will get uh, information on all the future videos and live streams every time they happen. We do hope you will continue to support us by watching and interacting with the videos by sharing, liking, and commenting. Now, moving on to today's lecture on oral submucous fibrosis. This is from the Proceedings of the International Case Presentation Conference 2022 by Professor Ranganathan. Well, let's watch it together. I hope you will enjoy this. Dr. Kanan Ranganathan is Professor and Head in the Department of Oral and Maxillofacial Pathology, Ragas Dental College, Chennai. Dr. Ranganathan was the first Indian oral pathologist to hold the prestigious post of President of the Asian Society of Oral and Maxillofacial Pathology and Secretary of the International Association of Oral Pathologists. He was also past President and past Secretary of the Indian Association of Oral and Maxillofacial Pathologists. He has authored more than 164 research publications and contributed to five textbooks. This is a testament to his expertise in the field of oral and maxillofacial pathology and in particular showcases his keen interest in cancer, precancer, oral submucous fibrosis, HIV and stem cell research. In addition to his many accolades in the field of oral pathology, he is a great orator and a much-loved teacher. It is a pleasure to welcome Dr. Ranganathan to deliver his lecture. Uh, thank you very much <clears throat> for this opportunity. Uh, it is a pleasure to be here on this platform of Oral Pathology 360, uh, along with Dr. Mandana and the team. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's been an amazing interaction the past few days. And uh, I may not be mistaken if I say that it's the first of its kind, at least in this part of the world. Uh, what I'm going to be presenting today is on oral submucous fibrosis. Uh, we're going to talk about different aspects of oral submucous fibrosis, uh, which is a potentially malignant disorder. Okay, this is how my presentation is structured. I shall very briefly talk about the disease itself and how uh, important it is uh, from a public health point of view and from the point of managing oral cancer, uh, at least uh, from India and Southeast Asian countries. Uh, it's so important that we have a separate section in the 2022 WHO classification uh, for oral submucous fibrosis. I shall briefly talk about the cause which is uh, the habitual use of areca nut. And uh, areca nut is probably the fourth most common habitually used substance globally. I shall touch upon the clinical and the histological features. Uh, talk very briefly about the pathways uh, in the pathogenesis of this condition. Uh, this is very unique in that uh, this is slightly different from the pathway of tobacco-induced potentially malignant disorders and subsequent oral cancer. 
There may be some overlap, but there are certain unique distinguishing features for oral submucous fibrosis. And I shall briefly touch upon that. Uh, what exactly is oral submucous fibrosis, which is usually abbreviated as OSF? It's a chronic insidious disease uh, that affects the lamina propria of the oral mucosa. And as the disease advances, the underlying connective tissue becomes very, very fibrosed, loses its fibroelasticity, and subsequently causes a lot of morbidity to the patient. The connective tissue changes lead to epithelial changes, which then becomes potentially malignant and in about seven to eight percent of the cases, progresses on to malignancy. So what you're looking at is actually on the, the pictures. On the extreme left, you have a classic case of oral submucous fibrosis. And then you have what looks like erythroplakia, but histologically was proven to be cancer. And then eventually, if you don't manage this condition, it progresses on to oral cancer. This is a potentially malignant disorder. And uh, it's very important to appreciate that almost half the cases of oral cancer in Taiwan and a few other Southeast Asian countries and India is attributed to betel quid. Uh, betel quid is nothing but a combination of betel leaf and areca nut in its various forms. And I shall touch upon that briefly uh, in my subsequent slides. And uh, it's very important to know that uh, this particular problem of chewing areca nut is very, very widespread in Southeast Asian countries. And given the globalization and the fact that there are migration of people and you have an international uh, diaspora in every country, uh, this is being reported in almost every country where areca nut is, what is available uh, for consumption. So the cause is areca nut. So what exactly is areca nut? Areca nut uh, is obtained from the areca palm, uh, which is uh, sort of uh, endogenous to tropical climate. And uh, it's, it's a cash crop in many countries, including India. And more than 600 million people chew areca nut. And that's, that's a very, very big number. And areca nut contains substances which are known carcinogens. And uh, interestingly, is the fourth most commonly used stimulant following caffeine, alcohol, and tobacco. And around seven to nine percent of them are progress to malignancy over a period of time uh, when they're in association with different factors. And I'll talk about that once again when I talk about the pathways. Okay, uh, this is the palm from which Arika has got, and this is the extracted nut. And these are processed and then subsequently a lot of condiments are added to that and they may be sold in sachets or uh, small cans for consumption by the public. Uh, many a times uh, the areca is used with a lot of spices, slicked lime and the betel leaf which you might see obtained from the piper betel wine and these are made into a small pack and then consumed. And that's what is called the beetle quid. Uh, it is really amazing the different varieties of areca nut which you can get. And there are a lot of regional variations throughout the world and within India. And these are just some of the possible ways or forms in which you can get uh, areca nut. Uh, and these are cured to varying extent. And they have the active ingredient, the alkaloids, the areca alkaloids available to varying amounts depending upon the type of processing they undergo. Okay, these are the major alkaloids involved in the changes uh, which the areca nut induces within the uh, human body. You have aricoline, you have aricadine, you have guacoline and guacine. And the addition of lime to areca along with the beetle leaves uh, enhances the release of the alkaloids uh, within the oral cavity. And it's interesting to note that aricadine can actually interfere with some of the uh, reward uh, neurotransmitters available in the central nervous system. And this may be one mechanism by which uh, people become very, very addicted to this substance in its various forms. 
this is just a quick view of the number of publications. If you do a PubMed search on oral submucous fibrosis, right from 1964 to 2022, you can see that there has been an explosion uh, in the uh, awareness of this problem as reflected by the publication and the number of people who are working on this particular uh, condition, which is oral submucous fibrosis. Uh, you have studies of all category. You have animal-based studies, cell culture studies, uh, longitudinal human studies, and uh, prospective studies and systematic reviews. So there's a tremendous increase in interest. And this increase in interest parallels the increase in use of areca nut uh, globally, and also the uh, incidence of oral submucous fibrosis, uh, which if not treated, progresses on to oral cancer. And the pathways by which it does, as I mentioned earlier, uh, is, is totally different uh, from what happens with tobacco. So what happens, what exactly are the clinical features? Um, there are very many people in different parts of the world uh, who may not have seen this condition. So I have a series of pictures to show you uh, the, the wide variation of clinical signs uh, which you can get in these patients. Um, let me first list what are the <clears throat> common symptoms and signs. The patient in the early stage usually complains of a burning sensation, uh, which may or may not be uh, accompanied by vesicle formation. And as the lesion progresses, as submucous fibrosis progresses, the fibrosis increases, there are palpable fibrous bands in the mucosa. It could be labial, buccal, lingual, any part of the oral mucosa, uh, which can also extend to the oropharynx. And because of the fibrosis, uh, there is a pallor to the mucosa, which is affected. And this fibrosis significantly alters the flexibility of the oral mucosa. There's what is called a stiffening of the oral mucosa. Uh, the patient is unable to open the mouth fully, unable to protrude the tongue, unable to use the buccinator muscle uh, in a blowing action. And all these reflect in the difficulty in eating and swallowing, uh, leading to dysphagia. Uh, there may be uh, other lesions associated with submucous fibrosis or superimposed on submucous fibrosis, uh, like lichenoid reactions, erythematous patches, more of a hypersensitivity reaction, and uh, encrustation of the particles within the mucosa, giving a reddish-brown appearance, uh, depending upon what formulation of areca nut is used by the patient, how the patient pouches it, and how much salivary flow the patient has. Uh, this is a classic picture which you will see in a lot of articles and uh, journals. Uh, the, the, the difficulty, normally you have about three finger widths of mouth opening. Uh, this is a, probably an intermediate case where the patient is able to open for two finger width. And there is significant decrease uh, in the interincisal distance and which sort of becomes progressively worse. And in very severe cases, uh, the patient can probably just put a straw inside the mouth to take food in the liquid form. It can be that severe. Uh, the early stages in the labial mucosa, you may just see a mild atrophy with sort of a very, very mild macerated appearance. And as the lesion progresses, you can see extensive fibrosis, uh, which will make movement of the lip very, very restricted. And you can't even pucker your lip. It can be very severe in the late stages. And secondarily, because of the underlying fibrosis, uh, the, there is stretching of the surface mucosa. Uh, the fibrosis involves the minor salivary gland, and you can start seeing the opening of the salivary gland very, very prominently. And just few of them secrete saliva. So the fibrosis completely encircles the minor racini. And you have this very, very characteristic stippled appearance of the labial mucosa in severe cases. In the palate, uh, it can be very mild with only the palatal arches showing a pallor and mild fibrosis. And when it becomes very severe, it can have this sort of mottled marble-like appearance. You have pale areas, red areas, and pigmented areas uh, with a very, very blotchy pallor. And when it becomes very severe, the uvula becomes totally deformed and bent, and the patient is unable to 
move the uvula or the soft palate during swallowing. Uh, you can see that there is extensive fibrosis in the palate. The uvula is completely deformed and you can see some leukoplakic patches right there. And you can see some erythroplakic patches on the buccal mucosa. And you can see these sort of vertical fibrous bands. It's a very, very characteristic in the posterior area and in advanced oral submucous fibrosis. The tongue is also not spared. You get extreme atrophy of the tongue with or without leukoplakia. And a lot of these will take up toluidine blue indicating surface changes within the epithelium. Uh, in the case of floor of the mouth, because of the saliva, and if the patient has at least some amount of salivary flow from the submandibular gland, you tend to see a rather erythematous and a macerated appearance uh, where sometimes the patients pouch the areca nut. And in severe cases, you have fibrosis, just like what you saw in the buccal mucosa and in the labial mucosa, uh, giving the floor of the mouth uh, a pallor and sort of a marble-like blanched appearance. The cheek is affected in most of the cases because the uh, majority of these patients pouch the areca nut uh, adjacent to the molar in the posterior aspect. Uh, early stages can be very subtle pallor mixed with the normal appearance of the oral mucosa. And uh, with prolonged pouching, you see this very, very characteristic maceration of the oral mucosa and pigmentation. And in advanced cases, you can actually see the extensive fibrosis, pigmentation, and erythroblastic areas right there. Um, the interesting thing is in this particular patient, oral prophylaxis was done, uh, though not complete, and the patient had discontinued the habit. And even after the discontinuation of the habit, the fibrosis does not reverse. So it's a pretty recalcitrant condition. And uh, it is very, very difficult uh, to manage the limited mouth opening in these patients. It, it's, it's a very big clinical challenge to rehabilitate these patients. And many a times, the areca nut is mixed with uh, tobacco. And uh, when tobacco and areca nut are mixed together, uh, it's a very synergistic effect, and the risk for malignant transformation significantly increases. And this is a classic pouching where there's a combination of tobacco and areca nut in the vestibule. You can also see lichenoid reaction, which has sometimes been mistaken for lichen planus and treated with uh, corticosteroids. Uh, this is probably submucous fibrosis uh, with a reaction to the ingredients in the areca nut. Uh, like I mentioned, areca nut is mixed with condiments and a lot of additives, and the mucosa may react to that with a hypersensitivity reaction. So in addition to the fibrosis, you may see a lichenoid reaction in the buccal mucosa or the labial mucosa. Uh, this is one of our cases in which uh, this patient had submucous fibrosis and this erythroplakic region uh, with a few white speckled areas, uh, which on biopsy was actually early invasive squamous cell carcinoma. And the problem in these cases is uh, normally when we talk about leukoplakia, uh, we say you palpate and if you feel induration on palpation, it probably is an ominous sign and uh, you have to you know, take a biopsy to rule out uh, squamous cell carcinoma. Uh, but unfortunately in these patients, there is extensive fibrosis. So palpation for induration really does not work for these patients because most of these lesions on palpation are very fibrous and appears to be indurated. So uh, like you saw in the past few slides, it can have a wide range of clinical manifestation. And uh, unless you're aware that these are associated with areca nut and take a sufficient history, uh, you may miss early cases. And by the time the patient lands up with TB, it's again, it's fairly advanced and management becomes very, very difficult. The histopathology is pretty unique and straightforward. And most of these cases almost have a very, very similar histopathology. What you see is a biopsy from the buccal mucosa. Uh, there is atrophy of the surface epithelium. And sometimes the atrophy is so extreme that you only have about three to four layers. It may or may not be hyperkeratinized. There is total flattening of the reti ridges, absolute flattening of the reti ridges. And you see this sort of what is called as 
juxta epithelial hyalinization. As you go deeper, you see this sort of loose fibrous connective tissue. But when you look at this particular area, it seems to be a little bit amorphous and has a hyalinized appearance. And this is what is termed as juxta epithelial hyalinization. Uh, when you look at it under higher magnification, this is how it looks like. Uh, you look at the lower portion, you can sort of make out the collagen fibers a little bit, uh, but on the top, you see that it is totally become very homogeneous. And this sort of hyalinized appearance, particularly in the subepithelial region, and uh, as the lesion progresses, it goes deeper, uh, involves the muscle fibers also in the deeper part of the connective tissue. And this is very, very classic. The combination of epithelial atrophy, the flattening of the reti ridges, the juxta epithelial hyalinization, which can extend to involve the muscles, and you can have secondary muscle damage or degeneration. These are classic features of uh, oral submucous fibrosis. In a few cases, you can actually see what you're looking at is uh, the, the subepithelial vesiculation right here. Uh, this is not very common, uh, but some of these patients do have these sort of vesicles on the oral mucosa. Uh, and this is a histopathology which shows this classic subepithelial vesicles filled with lots of extravasated red blood cells. Uh, this is a hypermagnification of the deeper muscle fibers. And these are normal muscle fibers. And you can see that there is extensive muscle degeneration here. So the combination of the submucosal fibrosis and muscle degeneration causes severe restriction in mouth opening. And this extends to involve the oropharynx so that there is significant dysphagia. And uh, even examining some of these patients with advanced cases becomes very difficult. And you may need to use an endoscope uh, to really look into and examine the mucosa. So now you have a rough idea about what the clinical features look like and what the classic histopathological features look like and what the possible variations are. Then looking at the pathways, uh, some of the pathways are being studied uh, very, very recently. Um, and it involves multiple pathways, but what if anybody is interested in working in oral submucous fibrosis, I draw your attention to this issue uh, in triple ohm. This is a little bit old, but still very relevant today. And there was, this was a, a focus issue on oral submucous fibrosis. And the entire issue had dealt with different aspects of oral submucous fibrosis. And it's a good place to start uh, if you want to have an idea about what exactly is happening in oral submucous fibrosis. OK. The, the problem is with the use of aricarnat with or without tobacco, the normal progress is to oral submucous fibrosis, which eventually becomes cancer. See, the aricarnat is the problem, and more specifically, the alkaloids, the aricoline alkaloids and the polyphenols within, within the aricarnat. Uh, an interesting finding is that copper, when it is combined with aricarnat, when the copper levels are high, there is more availability of aricoline and the alkaloids within the oral mucosa. And a lot of processing of aricarnate as the aricarnate gets processed or what is called cured, the copper content increases and the amount of alkaloid which is released and subsequently the toxic effect on the mucosa which progresses to oral submucous fibrosis uh, becomes more more prominent. So, the, the other interesting thing to appreciate is just like for any other habituated substance, there is a genetic predisposition. Uh, there are very many people who chew arica nut, uh, but there is a genetic predisposition where some of these patients uh, develop oral submucous fibrosis very quickly. And if you peruse the recent literature, and this has been our experience at our center also, uh, earlier we used to see submucous fibrosis in patients in the fourth and the fifth decade. Now the patients are more anger we start seeing them in the second and the th uh, third decade. And even more earlier within the first decade, we have seen a few cases. So what has happened is, for some reason, if you have this habit at a very younger age, uh, the, the oral submucous fibrosis sort of, sort of comes very, very fast and progresses to cancer pretty rapidly. And uh, there is a genetic predisposition because we have seen familial cases of oral submucous fibrosis. Uh, 
fitter habits on all different age groups being affected. And uh, the other thing which you have to remember is in many of the countries where Arika nut is used, uh, there is there's no stigma attached to the use of Arika nut. Uh, there is a lot of uh, public interest messages going out in the recent past and we are doing that very actively. But otherwise, Arika nut does not have the stigma like tobacco and alcohol has. So you see a lot of younger people consuming more of these products. And with respect to malignant transformation, uh, what seems to be very important is I know the slide is a little bit small and I have a larger slide following this, is the epithelial mesenchymal transition. Uh, this seems to have a very, very critical role in the progression of oral submucous fibrosis to cancer. Uh, this is a very, very busy slide. Um, let me help you understand this. Uh, the fibrosis is because of the Arica alkaloids. Uh, a very, very crucial factor are the integrins, particularly alpha-5, beta-6 integrins. And a very significant step in the malignant transformation is the epithelial mesenchymal transition. That's very important. And three things uh, which are very important in acquiring submucous fibrosis and in its malignant transformation is one, genetic susceptibility. Two, the pathway which is involved in fibrosis, which has TGF beta. And there have been suggestions that if we can interfere with this pathway, uh, we can attenuate the problem or eliminate the problem of oral submucous fibrosis and also the hypoxia subsequent to fibrosis. So genetic susceptibility, the TGF beta and hypoxic pathways are a very important uh, intermediate steps in the fibrosis caused by auriculine, which eventually results in the malignant transformation of the surface epithelium. Not very many work or not very many work has been done uh, with resp respect to biomarkers like you have in leukoplakia and other potentially malignant disorders. Uh, our group uh, at our center, uh, we did a recent publication on uh, a scoping review, uh, which addressed the immunohistochemical biomarkers in OSF. And uh, I'll just, let me just present this data very, very briefly. Uh, what, what we attempted to do was uh, split the biomarkers into epithelial markers, connective tissue markers, proliferative markers, markers of stemness, those which are involved in particular signaling pathways, and the miscellaneous markers which involve inflammatory, metabolic, enzymes, proteins, and transcription factors. Uh, we followed the PRISMA guidelines. Uh, I'm just going to highlight the important points here. Uh, we were able to identify 857 articles which met our criteria. And uh, when we started stratifying them, depending upon the validity and the, uh, the, the relevance of the article, we finally were left with about 86 articles which were included. And uh, this is just a sort of a summary of the different markers. Uh, right up, we had about seven articles that studied alpha, SMA, and e cadherin And then you have CD34, VEGF, and a series of articles down below which have been studied in oral submucous fibrosis. Uh, we did a unique, both univariate and multivariate analysis, and that's the data which you see here. You have the biomarkers here, starting from alpha, SMA, right there, e cadherin VEGF, down to fibroblast growth factor and its receptors right at the bottom. Uh, the, the, the red boxes are not statistically significant. Uh, the arrow points upwards, it's an upward expression. It's an increase in expression. And if it's downwards, it's a, a decrease in expression. And uh, the yellow boxes uh, indicate that only a descriptive analysis was available. Statistics was not available. And all the green boxes indicate uh, those which were statistically significant. So we, we do know the, uh, the, the profile of what exactly is happening to different molecular markers in oral submucous fibrosis. And uh, this is uh, by means of the classification of markers. You have epithelial markers, connective tissue markers, uh, proliferative markers, and miscellaneous markers. There is, there is a whole range of markers. And the interesting thing is, there is a little bit of overlap with leukoplakia and oral potentially malignant disorders. Uh, but there are very many unique markers which seem to be exclusively 
up-regulated or down-regulated in oral submucous fibrosis. Uh, so what, what we have understood from perusing the literature and from our personal experience is that uh, a lot more work needs to be done with submucous fibrosis. Uh, the, the common question I'm asked in very many international conferences is that uh, this is a problem only in some parts of the world. Uh, not necessarily, uh, given the fact that uh, you have in Southeast Asian and Indian diaspora globally, and, uh, and most of the countries I have traveled to, you have Arika Nut available uh, either in the Indian stores or the regional stores there, Asian stores there. And uh, we have cases reported from almost any country, you name it, in, in geographical location. And though it is a problem in Southeast Asian and Indian countries, and at least in this part of the world, uh, more than 50% of the cancers is attributed to oral submucous fibrosis or the use of Arika uh, But what is important is even the remaining 50% who do not sort of are fortunate enough to not have malignant transformation, there is significant morbidity associated with restricted mouth opening, inability to eat, and uh, the upper oropharynx being affected, severe dysphagia, and uh, that by itself is a surgical challenge to rehabilitate this patient. So let me stop here uh, by summarizing that oral submucous fibrosis uh, is caused by Arika nut used in its various forms. It, its classic features are extensive fibrosis and loss of flexibility of the oral mucosa, which can extend to the oropharynx causing severe dysphagia. It is a potentially malignant disorder uh, with a malignant transformation rate of between 7 to 9%. Uh, there is a lot of interest uh, gaining in this particular lesion, uh, particularly because of uh, the rapid increase in use of or habituated use of Arika nut. And, uh, but still, we have a long way to go uh, when you compare it to lesions like uh, leukoplakia, uh, proliferative varicose leukoplakia, and other <clears throat> potentially malignant disorders which have been extensively studied. Uh, thank you very much <clears throat> for this opportunity.